All right. Uh, I think we can start. Welcome everyone to this week at Army Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Tom Bammele uh, for a slightly exotic talk, let's say. Um, yeah, let's let's tell you something about Tom. Tom studied architecture, and that's already the first exotic thing, uh, and structural engineering at Vrije University in Brussels, uh, in Belgium. And he then received uh, his PhD in 28 uh, for a dissertation on the design and analysis of uh, membrane roofs. In 2010, he then joined the Block Research Group here at ETH, uh, where his work uh, contributed to a lot of the projects uh, that you can see in his webpage. Um, and, uh, and basically, the, some of those projects were presented at very cool venues, such as the Biennale in Venice. And I invite you to go on, on the group webpage to see the, the kind of beautiful structure they built, sometimes also with robots. Uh, Tom is currently the co-director and head of research at the uh, Block Research Group, and he leads the development of Compass, which is an open source computational framework for research and collaboration in architecture and structures. And uh, some of these things uh, are featured in today's talk, which is titled The Framework Approach to Computational uh, Design and Digital Fabrication. And uh, we are very interested in the talk. So Tom, don't be afraid about <laughs> the <laughs> lack of robotics in the, in, the, in the talk. The stage is yours. OK, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so today, indeed, I would like to talk about uh, what we call uh, a framework approach to computational research in architecture, engineering, and construction. Um, and, and especially demonstrate the importance of such an approach in the process of bringing research from early ideation and prototyping all the way to uh, industry ready systems and products such that they can have a real impact in the uh, AEC sector. <clears throat> uh, but so maybe first a few words about the work that we do at the BRG. Um, so a large part of our research, uh, for a large part of our research, we draw inspiration from the master builders of the past who did not have modern computational tools or technologies uh, or materials such as, uh, such as steel or reinforced concrete, but still managed to build amazing structures such as the fan vaults of uh, King's College, College Chapel in Cambridge. Um, which is the, picture, the, the, the structure you see here on the picture. Um, what is amazing about these vaults is, is not only their beautiful aesthetic, but also and especially that they span more than 12 meters with an unreinforced stone shell that is uh, only um, between 10 and 15 centimeters thick. So not only is this something that is almost unimaginable in today's practice, but these, these vaults have even been standing since the 16th century, which is quite a bit longer than the typical life uh, lifespan and life expectancy of the structures we build today. Um, with our work at the BRG, we try to learn from the design principles and the construction logics used by these master builders enhance them with uh, the computational tools that we have available today, combine them with digital fabrication methods, and then uh, into modern design uh, to construction pipelines that can be used uh, to tackle some of the challenges that our industry is faced with. Um, one of the projects that still represents this approach extremely well, in my opinion, is the Armadillo Vault, uh, which was part of the Beyond Bending expedition, uh, exhibition at um, the 2016 Biennale for Architecture in Venice. Uh, and this vault is a dry assembled cut stone uh, structure comprised of 399 limestone blocks that are held together by gravity only. So there is no mortar between the blocks, there is no glue, there are no mechanical connections, it's just good structural form and gravity keeping it all together, right? So again, uh, I can't emphasize this enough, all these blocks are really discrete pieces in a big puzzle uh, held together in space by their shape and by basically the earth pulling on it. Um, as you can see here, with spans of up to 16 meters and a thickness in some places of less than five centimeters. The stone shell in some places is proportionally thinner than an eggshell. 
Um, so to realize this structure, we set up uh, an integrated design to construction pipeline, including form finding based on thrust network analysis, which is a two and a half D interpretation of traditional graphic statics to find the overall shape of the vault, uh, tessellation design and the definition of Fuswar geometry to discretize the vault's funicular surface geometry into individual stone blocks, taking into account proper interlocking strategies and constraints of the available fabrication technologies and so on, uh, to then the translation of the discretized geometry to instructions for the fabrication process. Uh, and then finally, the actual fabrication of the individual pieces, the design of the formwork, and then uh, this assembly and uh, this centering strategy. And not only from a computational point of view, but also during execution, the entire process is really a combination of um, uh, modern technologies with traditional craft and manual labor and especially also the skill and experience um, of the expert stone masons who puzzle together these 399 stones uh, on top of a very basic formwork made out of standard, standard scaffolding props. Uh, and then once all of this was said and done, um, at the end, this formwork can then be taken away and then the vault stands by itself in pure compression. The objective of this uh, structure, which was the, the centerpiece of, of the exhibition that we were part of, uh, was to make a loud and a bold statement and to show that that good structural form does not have to be boring uh, and that it can be any, every bit as expressive as high-end architectural design. Um, but in fact, the real star of the show or the real stars of the show uh, were these small objects that you see here lurking somewhere in the back. Right. Um, and these objects were the rib stiffened funicular floors. Uh, and as the name suggests, rather than a flat plate, these floors consist of a funicular shell, which is designed to take uniform dead loads to the four corner supports in pure compression, where then the outward thrust resulting from the curved geometry is absorbed by external steel ties. And then the shell is stiffened with ribs such that it can resist also all other loading cases. Right? Uh, here in this view from the, from the bottom, you see the curvature of the shell already a little bit better. And of course, the external ties also absorbing the thrust. Right? So you see here at the boundaries, the definition of the curvature, and then these uh, black uh, lines that you see here are these ties that can absorb the thrust of the structure. Uh, so how this works is actually easiest explained using a, a 2D equivalent, uh, an arch, uh, which is uh, with the right geometry, this arch can resist a uniformly distributed load very efficiently. Um, but as soon as a sufficiently large load is added, uh, an additional load in addition, or a, a load in addition to this uniformly distributed load, the arch immediately becomes uh, unstable. And so to stiffen uh, this arch, we can add ribs or fins, which effectively increase the structural depth of the system and allowing new equilibrium states to be found within the geometric envelope of the structure. And then the ties or here represented by this, by this red uh, dotted line can then be added to absorb the outward horizontal uh, uh, action or the outward horizontal thrust uh, at the supports that is the result of this curved geometry. Uh, and then the way this is then uh, integrated in these floor plates is basically the 3D translation of, um, uh, of, of that two dimensional concept. Uh, which you see here on the right. Uh, so we have a curved shell that uh, takes all of the uniform loads and then the ribs stiffen this shell for all of the additional loads that are added uh, on top of this. Uh, the, the, this this um, shell thrusts towards the supports in the corners and then in the corners, there is a, a steel tie that goes around the perimeter of the structure and that absorbs this thrust. With this very simple concept um, of using material only where it is needed through good structural form, we can save uh, 60 to 70% of concrete compared to a traditional uh, slab for the same span and loading conditions and 80 to 90% of the steel. Uh, furthermore, since no reinforcement is needed inside of the concrete, all materials stay nicely separated, which simplifies circularity and recycling at the end of uh, life of, of, the, of the structure. 
Um, I will speak a little bit more about Hilo later, uh, but so here, um, uh, this, this after many years of, of research, we finally managed to uh, integrate these, these structures into an actual building, uh, so the Hilo at Nest. Um, and what you see here uh, at the top of the, uh, of the image is basically underside of, of this floor, uh, spanning uh, the space uh, here on the west side or on the left in, in the picture below uh, of the Hilo unit. Um, with, with exactly the same concept, right? Um, and so these floors here, uh, there are two of them, one in the room on the left, one in the room on the right, uh, with the same concept of this rib stiffened funicular shell spanning uh, already a, a quite significantly larger um, uh, space than uh, what you've seen at the, at the Venice Biennale. Uh, so here roughly uh, five by five uh, to five and a half by six meters. Um, and with exactly the same concept as before, so a very thin shell stiffened by these ribs, and so in this case, a, a shell of only three centimeters. So why am I uh, talking about these floors? I have already said a lot about master builders, good structural form, funicular floors, and so on. Uh, but why is this important? Well, um, I'm sure that you are all aware of the fact that the construction industry is a very large contributor to the climate crisis with um, uh, up to 40% of the emissions caused by human activities, 40% of the consumption of virgin resources, 40% of uh, the entire waste production, uh, and 40% of the total use of energy are in uh, some way attributable to the construction of our built environment. This is already now, um, but by 2050, um, the world's uh, population is expected to increase by another two and a half billion people. And so if we have to provide infrastructure for all of these people, um, we have to basically build something that is the equivalent of one New York City every month for the next 40, 30 to 40 years. Uh, if that is still somewhat of an abstract number, that, that means roughly um, more than 200 billion square meter in floors that need to be constructed between now and uh, 2050 to, to basically accommodate all of the additional people that will uh, arrive on this planet. Well, uh, arrive, uh, will, will live on this planet. Um, if we look at um, the, but many of these, uh, many of this additional infrastructure and many of these additional buildings will uh, be built as medium, uh, medium high rises. And if we look at uh, a typical medium high rise, then uh, we see that uh, of the total weight of the building, uh, actually 75% uh, is in the structure. Uh, so 75% of the building is basically there to keep itself up. Um, if we then refine this slightly further, then we see that of that um, uh, 75%, uh, more or less half or a little bit over half actually is in the floors. So 41% of the weight of the building is actually in its floors, right? So we, we are very inefficient in the way that we span space. And so you can immediately see that there is a gigantic impact to be made on uh, the, the, the uh, large contributions of the construction industry to um, all of the numbers that I mentioned earlier, simply by addressing or by doing an in intervention on the floors. And so we've done the, uh, sorry, uh, we've we've done the uh, calculation on uh, a building or on a on, on a, a high rise of twenty five or so medium uh, high rise of twenty five stories uh, of a competition that we were involved in. Um, with typical spans of up to seven meters, uh, a, a typical design with two cores and floor plates at every level of roughly um, 35 meters by 50 meters. And so by replacing uh, the floors in this building uh, with uh, the concept that I just explained, the um, potential savings are uh, gigantic. Uh, so you use 7,500 cubic meters of concrete less uh, which is more or less the same as uh, more than 1,200 trucks that don't have to go to the construction site uh, and 20 kilometer of 12 millimeter diameter uh, steel bars per, per level in the building. And so if you would lay this uh, all in one line, that is roughly the distance between um, Zurich to Brussels, all uh, steel that does not need to be used. 
Um, I'm not sure. No, I'll skip this slide. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there are a few images missing here, but so um, I started by saying that uh, I wanted to explain why um, uh, we, we advocate for this framework approach to computational research in AAC. And this, 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 this is an attempt to explain why kind of, uh, so that, that means that um, in order to be able to bring a concept like, for example, these, uh, these floors all the way from this initial ideation, uh, and initial prototyping all the way to um, uh, a real application in a real building and po potentially beyond uh, a product, uh, beyond that a product that can actually be used in the construction industry such that it can have a real impact on um, uh, the way we uh, build our built environment. Uh, you can imagine that um, you need a vehicle to reabsorb um, all of the findings, all of the research and all of the uh, developments done over many, many years and reintegrate this into a pipeline that basically allows you to actually bring this um, uh, to, to these real world applications. And so that is uh, something that we believe very strongly in. Um, and the framework that we at the BRG use uh, or have been using over the years uh, to accomplish this uh, is Compass. Um, so Compass is an open source framework for computational research and collaboration in the uh, architecture, engineering, and fabrication and construction industry, um, which is um, uh, or it, which started basically uh, at the BRG as the intern as, as our in-house framework, and then um, uh, was adopted by the NCCR and is uh, by now um, a, 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 an open source um, a thing uh, with many different contributors and um, uh, not only in the BRG, but also really here in the ITA building in the NCCR um, and, and uh, places beyond uh, ETH. Um, and so the, the, the framework uh, emphasizes three core aspects. Uh, so there is the, obviously this D, DRY, uh, do not repeat yourself and maybe more importantly or others, uh, the sharing of work and then collaboration. Um, and so to accomplish these things, uh, the framework provides a wide range of base functionality, but especially also easy access to peer reviewed uh, computational research libraries and tools. And to facilitate um, the collaboration between the many individuals and teams with very various academic and professional backgrounds that are typically involved in um, projects and, and research in this highly multidisciplinary industry of architecture and engineering construction. Um, Compass has been very deliberately uh, built um, uh, based on Python, not only because it accommodates all of these uh, different um, uh, types of backgrounds, different coding, uh, coding skills, different um, uh, coding styles and so on, uh, but also of course, because it comes with a gigantic um, uh, uh, um, a scientific stack of tools uh, that you can um, basically use for free, uh, but also because it, um, can be used very easily as a glue language between uh, various other libraries and, and platforms uh, written in potentially all other um, or very different languages. Uh, and also because um, in many software that it's, it's a very easy language to interface with um, AAC software. And in fact, in many different uh, softwares in the AAC industry, it is available as uh, a scripting API. And so with that as, um, uh, a base or the, this Python ecosystem as a base infrastructure, we built um, uh, the Compass ecosystem, um, which exists out of uh, a core framework and then a, a growing extension, uh, a growing collection of, of extensions uh, that address various uh, topics and, and, and problems and, and processes in the AAC industry. Um, so I'll, I'll try to give you a quick overview of, of what is available in Compass. Um, and then afterwards, I'll show through, through the HILO project um, how Compass plays a crucial role for us also as a group to, to be able to deliver these kind of um, uh, projects in collaboration with, with partners uh, from industry and in real context. But first, the core framework. Um, the, core, the key component of the core framework is its core library, which provides all of the base functionality. So for example, a geometry library, uh, various data structures uh, ranging from simple edge graphs to half edge data structures to 
uh, have phase data structures for cellular meshes to uh, assembly data structures and to all sorts of uh, combinations of that. Um, and then also, um, and that's maybe the only part about robotics in my entire presentation, I think. Um, and also a lot of uh, fundamentals for, for working with robots. Um, in, in addition to that, there or the second component of the core framework are the bindings. Um, so these are the packages that basically provide easy access to um, libraries like Seagull from where we get Boolean operations uh, and slicing techniques and all sorts of other things. Um, uh, binding for Gmesh from, from where we get, uh, for example, um, high quality uh, FE meshing, both in 2D and in 3D. Uh, and then Compass OCC, which is a binding uh, around uh, the open cascade um, technology, which uh, gives us um, uh, boundary representations and um, uh, NURBS geometry. Um, in addition to that, and to be fully independent of proprietary software and to be able to work really um, uh, completely standalone and across platforms and in all sorts of different environments, Compass comes also with its own uh, basic visualization tools. Um, but then, of course, uh, since we do work uh, with CAD software on an almost daily basis uh, through these integration packages, um, uh, Compass um, uh, seamlessly integrate with software like uh, uh, Rhino, uh, Grasshopper, and Blender. So all of this can be used directly out of the box um, uh, as soon as Compass is installed because of these independent visualization tools. Um, and then can be used with a uniform API, uh, can be used with a uniform API um, uh, in different software. So whether you're working in Rhino or in Blender or in the viewer or in Grasshopper, uh, Compass code is actually always exactly the same. Um, this is uh, all of this is fully cross-platform and then can be easily installed using the again the, the tools provided by the open source community. I'm sure you all know uh, Anaconda and Conda. So with Conda is for Compass, uh, you're basically good to go. And so with this as a, a base infrastructure, many um, researchers and research groups have been making their work available, not only here in the ITA building, um, uh, but also really from uh, all sorts of places all over the world uh, as, as uh, extension packages, uh, which we now have started grouping into um, toolboxes that are uh, grouped around particular processes in the AEC industry. And so there is, for example, a digital fabrication toolbox uh, which provides uh, packages for working with uh, for working with robots for robotic assembly and robot coordination um, packages for additive manufacturing processes so for example for um, uh, fancy slicing through complex meshes but also through uh, do volumetric uh, modeling through science distance fields um, uh, all the way to uh, packages for dealing with uh, timber construction um, there are a lot of packages for form finding and then a recent addition, um, masonry assessment, um, where there is uh, a particular package providing a common data structure for working with uh, complex discrete element models and uh, assemblies of, of um, uh, uh, block volumes. And then around that, uh, a whole range of um, um, uh, solvers that are compatible with uh, each other through this data structure that allow you to solve all sorts of questions related to the stability of masonry structures, both uh, in design and in uh, assessment scenarios. Uh, and then maybe last but not least, um, this maybe for more for an engineering audience, uh, is there, there is a finite element toolbox that basically provides an abstract modeling language for uh, FE analysis problems, where uh, from a single formulation, um, uh, uh, FE analysis problems can be solved with multiple backends um, available on your computer. Um, there then, uh, as a, maybe a last component, uh, recognizing that programming, especially in our industry, uh, and especially also in architecture, is not for everyone. Um, we've added another layer on top of this that um, uh, provides uh, developers with the opportunity to release their, um, uh, their work through uh, 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 tools based on graphical user interfaces. So starting from uh, the core compass packages, adding um, uh, research packages and adding then a thin uh, UI layer, which we, for example, used to uh, release Rhino Vault 2, which is uh, a tool for funicular form finding um, uh, in, in, uh, in Rhino, but also in Blender and soon potentially also in the browser, uh, which provides users with 
um, uh, an easy way to start accessing all of these packages and all of that research uh, through a simple graphical user interface that they're familiar with from their everyday work. But it also works in the other direction. So from there, they can start exploring um, how these commands work, uh, go look up how the uh, commands are implemented, how the research behind it is implemented, how the code is actually uh, uh, written. And then I don't know what is missing here, but yes. <laughs> um, I, sorry. Yeah. yeah, there is a part of this picture missing, but it doesn't matter. And same here. Yeah. Um, and then, so with all of that, with all of these, this, these tools, this infrastructure, these um, mechanisms uh, for making uh, this research also available through graphical user interfaces and to build upon uh, the work that others have done in the years before you and so on. Um, many projects uh, have already been done uh, in, in the meantime, uh, using Compass with various degrees of uh, involvement, various also at various scales. Um, and um, um, uh, various levels of complexity. So here you see a bit of an overview of projects that uh, were done not only by the PR PRG, but um, by various people here also in the NCCR and in the ITA building. Um, and the project that um, I would like to use as an example of uh, why this, this um, way of framework thinking and how we, we use that also in, um, in real world situations is uh, the, the biggest project that we've done so far uh, as a research group, which is the Hilo unit at NEST. NEST is, um, I'm sure that you all um, have heard of uh, about it, is uh, an innovation platform in Dubendorf uh, from Empire and Airwag, um, where um, next evolution in sustainable building technologies can basically be put into practice uh, and where um, researchers and academics and academic uh, groups can uh, test out the newly developed uh, techniques and technologies uh, in real world conditions with real world constraints and especially also with partners from industry in order to bring these uh, technologies a little bit closer to uh, adoption in the real construction industry. Uh, high, high low uh, stands for high performance uh, low with low energy and emissions. Uh, and so that uh, refers to the objective of the unit of uh, showing that it is actually possible to build uh, a high performance um, uh, unit with uh, a net energy plus um, uh, target um, while um, uh, uh, so with with extremely low uh, energy requirements during operation and with um, uh, while or while minimizing the um, uh, required emissions during the construction phase. And so there are many um, innovations included in this unit to reach those targets. Um, so here there are um, a few of those included on this slide. I already talked very briefly about this rib stiffened funicular floor system, which is also included in the unit. Um, but uh, to, to showcase how we use Compass, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the, the doubly curved two-layered concrete shell uh, that is that expressive roof that you saw in the uh, picture earlier, and then especially also the flexible formwork system with on-site active control that was developed to, um, to make this thing. So the roof is a, a, a double-layered um, or two-layered uh, um, concrete sandwich shell. Um, or a doubly curved um, concrete sandwich shell with two layers uh, of concrete spaced by um, foam blocks and then connected with uh, concrete ribs and tied together with a steel connector. I'll show uh, what this means uh, a little bit later in the presentation. And so the challenging aspect of this thing was that it needed to be built on or that it um, uh, had to be built on this flexible formwork system, which you see here. Um, uh, close, uh, uh, yeah, at a stage in the construction where it's almost, uh, uh, where the, the formwork system is almost entirely set up. And so the goal of uh, using such a flexible formwork system is to uh, avoid the typical waste that is associated with the construction of, um, <clears throat> of shells with this uh, highly curved complex geometry. Um, here you see, for example, the, 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 um, the formwork uh, of um, a shell constructed uh, in, in, in Switzerland, uh, somewhere in, um, uh, in, in Lausanne, 
Uh, and then on the right, you see the typical amount of waste that is then afterwards the, the result of this. And so the principle of this um, cable net and fabric formwork system is very simple. Um, so instead of building a full formwork, uh, you start from a rigid boundary that is uh, supported by just standard scaffolding props. Uh, in that boundary, you tension a, um, uh, a cable net to span the space. And then over that cable net, um, there is a fabric. And this fabric forms the typical shuttering layer onto which then the concrete can be applied. Um, then a first layer of concrete goes on, uh, then the foam blocks are placed and you see here um, that, that some space is left in between all of the foam blocks to create this pattern of ribs that connects then the bottom shell uh, to, or the bottom layer of the sandwich construction to the top layer. So then on top of these, uh, in between um, uh, those foam blocks, uh, the ribs are sprayed and then on top of that, the second layer of concrete. Um, at that point, the, the structure is actually already self-supporting, so the scaffolding can be completely removed. Uh, and then um, multiple additional layers need to be added uh, for insulation and meeting all of these energy requirements and so on. And then finally, a uh, weatherproofing uh, layer goes on and then the resulting structure looks more or less like this. So here you see uh, this double layer shell in section um, with uh, this, this two layer uh, uh, concrete structure. So you have here the, the bottom layer, the top layer. Uh, these two layers are spaced by um, foam blocks, which you see in green. And then in between these foam blocks is this grid of ribs that connects these two layers together and forms some kind of a, a spatial truss of concrete, let's say. Um, and then uh, all of this, this entire package is then tied together uh, with steel ties that basically uh, sit at the intersection of all of the ribs to um, make this kind of like a, a, a strut and tie uh, concrete um, construction. Um, the reason for this uh, two layer system is um, uh, not only to give the, the strength, uh, the um, uh, sufficient structural capacity, of course, but also, uh, to allow uh, the, the bottom layer of the shell to be interrupted there where uh, the shell needs to cross uh, the facade. Um, and in a way that uh, this does not create any thermal bridges. So this is not only true here everywhere at the boundary, as you can see here, for example, oh, sorry again. Um, yeah, in this picture, um, but also, and especially of course, at this really big facade at the front of the building, um, where uh, there is a very large cantilever where then again this bottom uh, layer of, of these two, two or the bottom layer of this two layered sandwich structure needs to be interrupted such that there is no cold bridge uh, or, or heat transfer between the inside of the space and the outside. Um, so that's in principle uh, how this works. Um, there are of course quite a few challenges associated uh, with that. And the first uh, is already uh, is, is, is actually related to this first layer of concrete, with, which needs to be um, sprayed onto this flexible formwork. Um, and so the, it's, uh, the, the formwork is of course um, uh, pre-stressed, uh, so it is somewhat rigid, but it is after all a flexible formwork. So um, uh, what happens is that as soon as you start pouring concrete on this, the, the, the uh, cable net will actually deform. Um, and so this deformation needs to be taken into account when the pre-stress is designed such that uh, actually the, the, the roof sits a little bit too high um, and in exactly the right amount such that when uh, the concrete is added on top of this, that it sags in exactly the configuration that is needed for the shell to then harden. And then once that first layer is hard, um, the rest of the uh, system can be built on top of this. So for this, you need a very um, non-uniform specific um, or a very specific non-uniform distribution of pre-stress throughout the system. So this is a highly um, constrained optimization process, uh, uh, form finding process, um, which is not only constrained by the fact that under that weight of um, the, the concrete, this, this thing needs to sag exactly into the right geometry of the, the, the final shell. Uh, but also because of all the geometrical constraints uh, that come on top of this. So for example, there are many elements that will be mounted on the cable net uh, in advance and that actually stay in the shell afterwards, as we will see uh, in, a few, in a few minutes. 
Um, so for example, here you see the straight lines that correspond to these facades, uh, so these profiles where the glass uh, needs to come in, need, uh, which need to be, of course, 100% straight, such that the glass can be easily slotted in. Um, and they need to be 100% straight after uh, the thing deforms into its final configuration under the weight of the concrete. Um, once this um, uh, force distribution is determined, there is, of course, the second challenge of transferring this to the construction site and to materialize uh, this force distribution such that uh, it can be realized um, uh, on the roof of, of uh, the nest building. Uh, there, the obvious challenge is, of course, that this uh, to, to control this pre-stress very precisely, you need a very high precision in boundary conditions and uh, also the execution of the individual elements and the materialization of these individual elements of the cable net. Um, and considering that this thing spans 18 by 9 meters, there is obviously um, taking into account the usual tolerances of 2-3 centimeters in concrete construction on a um, uh, on a, a construction site, uh, there is a, um, uh, yeah, so that there needs to be a, a way to, to address this and to control and, and, and deal with those tolerances um, uh, once, um, once this is transferred in, into uh, the real project. And for this, we developed a very specific node uh, for the cable net. So the cable net does not consist out of uh, long um, uh, continuous cables, but is discretized into individual elements such that the, the, the length and the, the stiffness and um, the, the forces in these elements could be very specifically controlled. Um, so this is what you see here, right? So this node allows uh, these, these cables to be discretized in these individual elements. But then um, <clears throat> what this node also provides is um, a, a very precise uh, way to, or a very precise measuring point at every node in the cable net um, that then can be uh, measured on site. Uh, so here you see this little stick. And here you see this little stick um, sticking out of every uh, uh, node with these two balls, which can then be very precisely measured and then fed back into a model to reconstruct uh, the as-built geometry of um, of of uh, the of, of the cable net at any at any uh, stage during its construction, and so from this we can then uh, compute the deviation um, uh, between the cable net uh, in a, a particular state and then the geometry it needs to be in and the stress state it needs to be in for all of these layers to uh, sag into the correct geometry. Um, and then the challenging part is, of course, then to translate the deviations into required connections, uh, corrections on the boundary, um, such that um, uh, the, 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 the state of the cable net can be adjusted and can be brought closer to this uh, state that it needs to be in. And so for this, the um, uh, entire system was also developed at the boundary beams where each of these boundary segments could be actually pulled slightly further out or slightly further in. Uh, based on um, uh, this, this, um, these control algorithms or the, the, the feedback from these control algorithms such that uh, we could really, um, regardless of, of the precision of the execution on, on site, um, uh, based on the measurements, this, this thing could be brought in exactly the right configuration to start uh, the, the, uh, um, the production process. Uh, then the next step is, of course, related to then once this first layer is there, is to the further buildup. And then especially also because many of these elements um, that need to stay in the structure and help with connecting all of these layers need to be already available or need to be already integrated on the cable net from the start, uh, as you can see here. So, for example, these tie elements and then the facade elements that need to be integrated. And here again, the node was used as a logistical device to manage this complexity on site. So at the bottom of every node, you have these sticks, but and so that's the part that actually goes away afterwards. But then above uh, the node are all of these additional elements that then afterwards stay in the structure. So here you see the basic configuration with um, uh, these tie elements sticking out. Uh, but also, um, uh, for example, there where the facade needs to be slotted in, um, uh, these facade profiles could be mounted on um, uh, the cable net. Uh, and for example, here also to define the edge of the shell onto this um, fabric formwork. Um, uh, again, um, uh, a, a specific buildup of, of, of simple off the shelf elements could actually be added on top of this. 
And so this gave all of the people um, that needed to, um, uh, so the, the people from uh, professional practice and, and fabricators and constructor, uh, people from the construction industry who needed to come and execute their part basically on site could always use this node as a reference and as a logistical device to uh, know how and where uh, to install the elements that they needed to provide on this uh, highly curved and, and complex uh, geometrical system. So here you see, for example, the, uh, the, this big facade profile from the big cantilever, and then here the interaction between uh, the, the edge definition of, of the shell, and then again, the, the um, uh, facade profile at the boundary. And then um, once all of this is done, the, the shell is basically, or that the formwork is, is basically ready for the first layer of concrete. And what you see also here is that it was separated into several patches such that this concreting could happen over multiple days. Um, and with a, contour, a controlled a cold joint already designed at the interface between those patches. Um, uh, and then, so the first layer of uh, concrete is uh, sprayed on. Then, and here again, you see the, um, the, the role of these, these nodes and then these rods that stick out as, as a logistical device for dealing with the, the, that complex geometry on site. So all of the foam blocks could be easily referenced uh, with respect to these nodes, so that basically the, the, the complexity is reduced to a small quadrilateral packs, uh, patch uh, on, on, on this overall um, uh, geometry. Then once all of the uh, foam blocks are in place, they can be filled, the spaces in between can be filled up with concrete, and then the final layer of concrete goes on. Uh, and you see here again, the nodes sticking out, uh, waiting for then uh, all of the insulation layers to be added on top, uh, which are then again uh, tied down with these plastic plastic caps uh, again to these uh, to these nodes that um, uh, stick through all of these layers and again allow people to um, uh, uh, yeah, manage uh, the complexity of execution um, in a very simple, straightforward way. And so this, uh, in my opinion, gives them a very nice result. Also afterwards, once uh, the formwork is removed, where you see really how um, the shell was constructed there. You see the seams, um, sorry, the seams of, uh, of this fabric. You see the nodes still in there. You see the, 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 the controlled cold joint between all of the patches. And I think you can even, uh, even on this picture, see even the, the texture of the fabric um, uh, in, in the, the bottom surface of the shell. So what's the role of compass in all of this? Uh, as you can imagine, this is a project that, that um, uh, was developed over multiple years. Uh, so starting already in 2010 and 2012 with some initial small scale prototyping to then in 2015, the development of all of the control algorithms uh, that were needed. And, and so this entire measurement system uh, that were needed to control the geometry of the shell on site. Um, then a full-scale prototype here in the RFL uh, to prove that this was at all possible uh, to then um, the, the, um, the testing and analysis and characterization of this double-layered uh, sandwich construction. And then um, uh, to then in 2018 and 19, uh, the, the, the buildup of all of these layers together with partners from industry to make sure that all of the logistics were properly coordinated and that all of these uh, layers could be uh, properly build up uh, on site. So this this not only spans multiple years, but also multiple generations of researchers and all of this um, these developments and, and expertise that is built up over the years needs to be somehow um, uh, fed back into this development pipeline uh, that was then necessary to produce the final structure, which in itself um, was a process that involved many different uh, software tools, many different um, development processes from form finding to a fee analysis to the fabrication to uh, the control algorithms and so on. And so there again, Compass provided us a way for um, uh, to control all of these processes um, from uh, from a single um, uh, or from from a single computational tool, let's say, um, and. Um, typically, the, there is also the, the, the complexity that goes with um, making all of these processes together, uh, talking together and exchanging data between them and between um, uh, proprietary software uh, could now be taken out of the equation through um, the, the very flexible data structures that Compass provides, where all of the data involved in all of these individual processes could be stored in a single 
um, a source of information which uh, could then be passed around as data between all of these processes rather than uh, conversion to proprietary software formats and so on and so on. Uh, and then this, this, this same data set was then used to then um, uh, coordinate all of the logistics uh, between the different uh, executing partners, but also to provide them with all of the fabrication data uh, that was needed to, um, to, to, um, to go through this entire process, starting from really a very simple kit of parts uh, to build up the cable net to then um, the, the final structure, which you see here, um, where all of these uh, things then, uh, needed to come together. Um, and then this, this structure, like with the armadillo vault, is actually um, kind of a, a gigantic beyond, uh, neon um, uh, billboard or a near neon advertisement sign um, for uh, the floors that, um, that are in, in the spaces below. Uh, and that uh, we hope um, now will make um, even more their way into the real construction industry and can help um, uh, uh, transform uh, how we build our built environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, yeah. Interesting talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. No, no, sure. I mean, it's uh, it's interesting because uh, even though the the topics are kind of different from what we usually hear here, there are some things which are common. For instance, a framework through which people can interact. Uh, kind of the automation of these processes. So. I find it's very interesting. Let's open the stage for questions. Uh, if anyone has a question, you can simply unmute him or herself and, uh, and ask. Hey, uh, Tom. Um, yeah, I have a question. You know, first of all, you know, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, now, uh, so what are the objectives that you have when you do your, you know, your, your design, you know? And uh, in particular, I'm thinking of is like robustness or maintainability or longevity um, uh, a concern, right? So I'm just thinking of that uh, armadillo vault, right? So what if one of those tides break and you know, will the whole structure collapse or what will happen? Well, the armadillo vault, in that sense, is 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 a bit of a is is a bit of a different is a bit of a different thing, of course. Um, uh, in in the way that, um, as I said, it's 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 more of a a statement to show what is possible, kind of, if you're in full control of of, of geometry, and and to show that um, that that what people use people usually associate with funicular design or good structural form is is like a catenary or a parabola or uh, like basically boring shapes um, and to, to show that 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 this can be every bit as open-ended as as a typical expressive architectural design um, but in terms of robustness um, so for example this particular structure was was shown to to um, where we had to show that it could actually withstand a, a small uh, earthquake, uh, because um, uh, Venice is apparently um, uh, an, an, an earthquake, uh, earthquake sensitive zone, and we had to show that um, you, people could actually hang from, um, uh, from those open edges or, or that uh, significant loads could be add, uh, add on there um, uh, without the structure collapsing. Of course, uh, at some point, um, when, once too many stones fall, it's also not the case that if one stone falls out that this entire uh, thing collapses. Um, but of course, once uh, once uh, too many uh, stones uh, fall out, kind of, then then of course, uh, yeah, the, the 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 structure is gone, right? Um, but this is very different, of course, with 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 the floors, in the sense that um, here you 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 have this this uh, a compression shell um, out of unreinforced concrete, um, but that is completely stiffened um, by then by then these fins. And so, for example, for Hilo, what we dare to show was that uh, even under 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 fire um, uh, uh, conditions, so where, for example, there would be the possibility of explosive spalling or parts of the structure actually falling away, uh, that there is still sufficient robustness because of the curvature and the fact that these structures have a way to find different load paths towards the support, um, that that it was that it is robust enough and that there is enough redundancy to to even under these circumstances uh, to still stand. Right. So. Um, the armadillo vault is is in that sense maybe um, uh, yeah is is a different type of example, but for the floors, um, 
uh, we, we, we really have to show uh, also in now um, uh, applying this into real world projects and we're, we're trying to get this through competitions into real buildings. We always have to show that it complies with uh, all of the requirements set by Eurocode, that it complies with, um, uh, of course, all of the structural requirements, but also acoustical, fire safety, and et cetera, et cetera. So there are no shortcuts uh, here, right? So we, we, we have to deal with all of the, uh, the requirements that are standard in the construction industry. Um, and then in terms of longevity, uh, there is, of course, a really, real big advantage of, uh, for example, not having uh, steel rebar or steel reinforcement included in uh, the concrete, which is a source of, um, uh, over time, a source of degradation uh, for, for reinforced concrete. So here, um, uh, the, 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 the materials are nice and separate. So the, the, the concrete uh, is by itself, the steel is by itself. Um, which then offers all sorts of additional opportunities in terms of uh, circularity, uh, recycling, and, and, and so on and so on. But so um, in terms of robustness, because of the curved geometry, uh, these structures um, tend to find, find a way of, of, of keeps uh, or to, to keep standing, right? So this, this um, especially also in discrete structures, uh, they have a way of, of accommodating kind of for, for settlements at the supports and so on, uh, which um, many historical structures have also already proven over time uh, by standing for, for multiple hundred years, even though that they're not reinforced, that they exist out of discrete pieces and so on. Um, yeah, so, but, but maybe to summarize, um, we, we, we are, we, 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 with all of these developments, we, we do have to uh, comply and do comply with, with all of the requirements that, that uh, other building components also have to go through. Uh, uh, Thank you. The, yeah. Any other question? Maybe I have one since we are a robotics group. So what, what's the experience like for somebody using the tool for robot uh, assembly? Or uh, we saw, because I saw the icons in the, in the GUI you had, yeah. but I, I kind of tried to imagine how it works. Well, so at the moment, um, uh, uh, there, there are certain parts of the framework that, that are really for coders, kind of, in the sense that um, uh, there are, uh, like, for example, for Compass Fab, there is no graphical user interface. Um, uh, something like this might be added in the future, but, but that's simply not there yet at the moment. Um, uh, but so what we, what, we, uh, what, we, what we try to do is... is um, uh, yeah, through a very easy API, make many of these processes a lot simpler, right? Um, and and um, uh, yeah, so but yeah, but you still have to build uh, with with the, the the bits and pieces that are provided. You still have to build uh, a small application that, for example, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, through through an in, um, through path planning and, and motion planning and, and so on and so on. Uh, builds up uh, a wall that you first have to design. Uh, you get, for example, use then some of the masonry tools to dis the, the, um, design the discrete element assembly. Uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, the, for example, Compass Fab provides then the path planning tools, the, the collision detection, the, um, uh, and, and these kind of things to then work with these assemblies and to, with particular types of robots, um, uh, figure out how to uh, assemble them out of uh, individual pieces. Um, but so it's still a very hands-on uh, uh, process, of course, uh, that first and foremost um, uh, gives people doing research already the building blocks to actually make their research simpler. Um, it depends a little bit on where you are in the ecosystem, whether it's also from an end user point of view. So, so somebody who really just wants to play around with stuff, how easy that then becomes or not. Um, yeah, well, that's that's cool because uh, I think we had. Uh, I can send it to you later. We had a talk back in the days from people from Cornell doing automated uh, um, structures building. But it seems to me that your framework both includes the op the option to do all the the usual robotics things, but also to do all the structural calculations yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and leverage so that, do these things. Yeah. So the goal is indeed that in in one unified framework with one unified API, let's say that. Um, 
Uh, you can work with different software tools, but you can also work with uh, different um, uh, fabrication processes. You can work with um, uh, different types of analysis methods, form finding methods, and so on and so on. And then because they all build upon this core framework, um, the, you can very easily exchange data or processes between then these different packages and indeed start from an overall design discretize it, uh, use some of the fabrication methods to cut this up into blocks, uh, rationalize this um, based on some kind of uh, fabrication constraint, and then use indeed the, the, the robotics packages to plan how this, this and simulate how this thing then needs to be built up. Yeah, that's, indeed, that's indeed also the goal of, of um, th that you don't have to learn like 500 different uh, frameworks to be able to do these kind of things, but that you can actually from one, um, from one API can access all of uh, all of those tools and all of that research. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, any any final question maybe for Tom? Doesn't seem so. Uh, I want to thank you again, Tom. Uh, I will now monitor your web page for new expositions <laughs> and new new structures every, every once in a while. Uh, thank you again and good luck for the next ventures. Uh, yeah, thank and you. thank you, thank you all for participating. I see you all next week for the next autonomy talk. All right. Thanks. So thank you.